All right, we find ourselves in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. 20th chapter of the book of Acts. We're going to finish this chapter in this session. We're going to go from uh, verses 17 through 38. If you're following along in your notebooks, we're on page 245. Uh, this particular passage of scripture is one of my favorites in uh, the New Testament. And uh, I've mentioned this in the last session, and that is simply the reason for that is this particular message is a message that Paul the Apostle preached to Christian individuals, to Christian people. So we can learn some things that were very important in this particular uh, content, context and content uh, from the sermon that Paul preaches here. So let's Let's uh, bear with me, if you would, and uh, let's go to page, as I said, 245, and let's read down through our introduction at the top of the page. It's been about 20 years since Paul's conversion on the Damascus Road, which uh, we're going to date that around 35 A.D., something like that. We're 55 A.D., these, again, within a couple years, roughly. Scholars estimate the date of chapter 9, is about 37 AD. So you got 35 to 37, etc. It doesn't really make much difference. Paul has spent three years with the church at Ephesus. It's now approximately 58, maybe 60 AD, somewhere in there. Paul's reputation precedes him, though, wherever he goes. He is a uh, human gospel wrecking ball, if you please. He in himself has uh, turned the world upside down. He's a marked man, though, and he's endured several attempts on his life. Paul senses that this will be the last opportunity to personally address this particular group of Christians at the Church of Ephesus. He's headed for Jerusalem. He does not know if he will survive what takes place there. I mean, he's uh, going from the frying pan into the fire, so to speak. The message he delivers at Miletus, which is about 30 miles away, is Paul's last will and testament to them. This is his final charge, his last words. By the way, what Paul says is unique in that what follows is the only message, as I mentioned before, specifically given to Christians. Now, this is an important church, this church at Ephesus. And the reason why I say that is uh, for the reasons already given that this message is the only message to Christians. But Paul the Apostle also wrote a letter to this church. It's called the Book of the Ephesians. And thirdly, John the Apostle references this particular church in the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and chapter 3, the church at Ephesus. So we, three, we see three different times at least where the church at Ephesus is uh, mentioned. It's mentioned by Luke in Acts chapter 20. It's mentioned by Paul uh, in the book of Ephesians. And it's mentioned by John in the book of Revelation some 30 years after what uh, we're reading here in Acts chapter number 20. So uh, the church at Ephesus was an important church. Much to be said, much to be tracked. The progress from chapter 20 in Acts to Ephesians chapter 1 to what John writes to the church in the, in the book of Revelation. So let's pick up here in verse number 17 at the bottom of page 245 in our text. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. He's referring to his personal testimony, the type of individual he has, which we would hope would give him and would give all of us credibility if we have a good testimony. Serving the Lord, this is his testimony now, verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews 
and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Paul's life, in a sense, has been an open book. These people have had the opportunity to observe Paul's life and his ministry from the very beginning in Asia. He doesn't have any secrets, and he has purposely lived in such a way that he would be a good example in every way to these around him. In these first few verses here, he lists his priorities that he has held for the ministry. In fact, uh, I have preached a message going from the book of Revelation where the church at Ephesus is accused of uh, abandoning or leaving their first love, and I'm not sure that I'm quoting that exactly, but you can go to Ephesians or to Revelation chapter 2, I believe is where it is, where that church is confronted. It's uh, addressed as one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And uh, what is the first love? What is their first love? What was their church's first love? Now, it doesn't say in the text in Revelation exactly what it was, so we have to try to um, surmise, speculate on what it may have been. What their first love may have been is what is addressed here in this message 30 years before to the elders at that church. And that would be, in order of priority or importance, number one, their first love was, verse 19, they were there to serve the Lord, number one, to bring honor and glory to God. That is the top priority of the ministry. Number two, to Christians, he kept back nothing that was profitable for them. So the second priority was to teach or preach the whole counsel of God to Christian people. His first obligation or first priority or responsibility was to serve God. His second priority was to teach Christians. His third priority, testifying to Jews and Greeks alike, the lost. What did he teach them? Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So I would say that that's evangelism, evangelizing the lost. And then fourthly, his fourth priority would be found in the 24th verse, which says or references his own personal well-being. So let me run through that list again. His first priority, worship, serving the Lord. His second priority, discipleship, teaching Christians. His third priority, evangelism, witnessing to the lost. His fourth priority, himself, of which he gave himself little or no attention whatsoever. That's a pretty good list right there. Our worship relationship with God is certainly our most important. Everything we do, discipleship, evangelism, sir, our service, uh, all of that ultimately is an act of worship to the Lord. But we are reminded that we are here, number one, to serve him. We're not here to serve people. If the congregation doesn't like what the Bible says, I'm here to preach the truth of the Bible, not what the congregation would like to hear. We all know that. We understand that. There's no question about that. And we're not here to preach what the lost world would like us to preach, to let everybody know or let them know that they're okay, everything's all right. Don't worry about the Bible. Don't worry about Jesus. Don't worry about sin. It really doesn't exist anyway. Everybody's okay. You're okay. I'm okay. As long as you don't murder anybody, as long as you're not Adolf Hitler or the Boston Strangler, you're going to make it. There's probably only five people that'll be in hell, and I can't think of the other three. Anyway, no, that's what lost people would like to hear, I would assume. And then the, the last thing on the list is his own well-being. I've often said, 
if you, are, if you take care of God's business, God will take care of your business. If I will take care of God's business and be his business manager, then God will be my business manager. I believe it works out that way very, very simply. Paul's intentions, verse 22. Acts 20, 22, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things which shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul was headed for Jerusalem, we found in verse 16 of the chapter. He wanted to be there for several reasons. It was the feast of Pentecost. It was a Christian celebration also, Acts chapter 2. He had gathered monies for the saints in Jerusalem. He could deliver, and there were doors of opportunity. Many Jews would be in town to whom he'd have the opportunity to preach. But maybe there's a fifth reason. Bound in the Spirit. He says, I just know this is where I need to be. Now, I've had that sense about me in certain situations and circumstances in life. There are certain things that I knew that I should do, not just because they were right, and they were right, but I had even options to do several right things, but I knew that I should be at this particular place at this particular time. How do you know that? How do you know that? Well, is that the still, small voice? Is that the bound in the Spirit of which Paul speaks of in verse 22? He says, I just know I must go there. I need to be there. The Holy Spirit of God is compelling me to be there. Now, there's good reasons to be there, but there may be good reasons to be other places also. But he knows this is the right place to be. Paul is aware of the imminent danger. He knows full well that he's walking into the lion's den. And verse 24 strongly suggests that Paul believes this will be an important aspect of the completion of the fulfillment of his ministry. He uses the term, so that I may finish my course. May finish my course. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he uses this terminology when he writes, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, I've thought, I've heard others preach this, and I've thought this uh, to be true, and that is Paul had a sense about um, his life, his ministry, coming to a conclusion. I, again, I can't explain that. Did the Spirit of God give him this sensibility that, you know, I'm just about, you have done what I've asked you to do, your life is coming to a conclusion, or your ministry, as you understand it to be, is coming to a conclusion. How do we know that? How did Paul know that in 2 Timothy chapter number 4? Of course, that was the last book, the last chapter, as we understand it, that Paul wrote, and uh, he probably was right. He was finishing his course. He said in verse 24, and we mentioned this earlier, that neither count I my life dear unto myself. He says, I've given up my rights to my life. My life is not my life, for to me to live is Christ, Philippians chapter 1, and to die is gain. He notes in Colossians chapter 3 that Christ, who is our life, that's what life is all about. It's about Christ's desires in agenda for my life. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we read this. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you're bought with a price. Therefore, 
glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We are here to glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are God's. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3, 4, 5, all through that first chapter, basically tell us that that's, uh, we have been chosen in Christ to do what? To be to the praise of of his glory chosen in christ and i would note it doesn't say chosen to be in christ and i also would note that the word or term or terms elect or election are not found in the book of ephesians like some people would have us believe we are chosen in him if you're in christ you are chosen to bring praise and honor in glory to his name that's what romans chapter 8 verse 29 is all about i'm predestinated i'm predestined to what to salvation no i'm be i'm predestined to be conformed to the image of god's son i'm predestined to be christ-like that's what i'm predestined to be ultimately and will i will when i see him i'll be like him is that 1 John chapter 3, verse 1? Somewhere in that area. 1 John 3, 1, 3, 2. When I see him, I will be like him. I will be like him. Well, anyway. Um, I'm getting off on a little bit of a tangent there. Sorry, I, forgive me for all, all of that. No charge for the extra theology, though. <laughs> you may not agree with it either. <laughs> Don't, you're not getting your money back. Okay, all right. For many Christians, Christianity is something that they practice on weekends for a couple of hours. Christianity is our life. Look at verse 25 of Acts 20. And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take ye to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. We dealt with this blood of men uh, uh, earlier in an earlier chapter in the book of Acts. So I won't take a lot of time to go into that, although we have written uh, some of the same material. Uh, We've repeated it here uh, in our notes. Paul's personal ministry is about to end. He knows that this will be his last visit with these brethren. The occasion lends great importance to the words that are given to us by the Holy Spirit of God, he says, I am pure from the blood of all men. Wow, that's quite a statement. That's quite a statement. To say I've never been neglectful. Every time I've had the opportunity, every time I've been uh, compelled to share the truth of God's word with people, I've been faithful in doing that. And I am pure from the blood of all men. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my depart, departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Boy, did Paul know what he was talking about. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. That's why he's pure from the blood of all men. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities. Paul was a tent maker, remember. And to them that were with me, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, and this is, we have no record in the Gospels that he said this. This is our only record in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, that Jesus said, It is 
more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. For the human mind, self-centered, fleshly mind, it is difficult, probably impossible to grasp that statement you have to understand, at least understand, the concept of charitableness and love. You have to have a beginning understanding to understand what that statement, it's more blessed to give than receive, what it even means. And I would say this, that you'd have to be converted. You'd have to be a Christian, a Christian maturing in your faith to truly understand what that means and be blessed, be happier, giving then actually receding, receiving, excuse me. <laughs> Take heed therefore unto yourselves, verse 28 says. Paul is charging them with responsibility. The elders were given the responsibility to lead and guide and protect and feed the church. The church is likened to a flock of sheep. In fact, Jesus likened believers to sheep in the Gospel of John. He is the good shepherd the good shepherd and his sheep know his voice jesus said by the way he knows his sheep too i might add the church is likened to a flock of sheep the elders are the shepherds or the overseers they oversee the sheep the importance the holy ghost god hath purchased these sheep this church with his own blood here is a Trinitarian statement or reference. Does God have blood? The reference is the blood of Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There will be attacks on the flock. Grievous wolves are going to come in, Paul says. Jesus warned the disciples of the same thing. So this is nothing new for us. We see back in Matthew chapter number 7, beware of false prophets. In fact, he uses the term in 7.15 of Matthew. He calls them ravening wolves. Notice in the Old Testament, the imagery in the book of Ezekiel, that there is a conspiracy of her prophets. Ezekiel 22.25, in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion, ravening the prey they have devoured souls look at verse 27 her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain these things were prophesied by ezekiel 600 years before christ christ spoke of them and paul is recognizing the same and the same is true today. Ravening wolves coming in, in the, into the flock, seeking to gain followers for themselves, for their own personal gain, whatever that might be. They will speak, verse 30, perverse things and draw away disciples after them. Many a church split is described right there in that phrase draw away disciples after them that's what a church split often is not all the time sometimes churches need to split for maybe even when i say good reasons i mean there are there are reasons logical reasons why churches split the best reason for a church to split is to make two good churches out of one and divide the leadership to cover or to reach more people. But sometimes churches split because there is a doctrinal controversy and one group may leave for good reason because doctrine has changed or practice has changed or the immorality of the leadership, whatever it might be, and churches oftentimes divide. Someone said churches never split in two, they split in thirds. One half goes that way, the other half goes that way, or excuse me, one third goes that way, one third goes that way, one third goes nowhere. Unfortunately, oftentimes there are casualties in those situations, are there not? 
watch, verse 31. Paul emphasizes his passion, intensity for a caring uh, for this church. Note the emphasis in verse 32. The word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance. Again, the importance of reading, studying, memorizing scripture daily as we grow in grace and knowledge. Paul then reiterates his testimony. He says, I've coveted nothing. I have ministered unto my own needs. I've showed you to support the weak. And remember, it's more blessed to give than receive. More blessed. I've coveted nothing. It's more blessed to give. I took care of my own needs. I've sh shown you to support the weak. And it's more blessed to give than to receive. So Paul prays then with them and he departs. Acts 20 verse 36. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore. They all had the sense about them that this would be the last opportunity for them to be in Paul's presence. They fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him under the ship. So Paul had at this point, he had a sense or a sensibility that his ministry, uh, up as it had been practiced up to this point, was coming to a close. Of course, he headed off to Rome. We're only in chapter 20. We still have eight more chapters of this book to go. But they chronicle the, the uh, end of his third missionary journey and also his trip to Rome. That's what we're going to find in the remainder of the book of Acts. But uh, he had a sense about him that this would be the last time that he would be here uh, among these people in this church. The scene may be, in a sense, reminiscent of Christ's departure and his goodbyes to his, and with his disciples. Paul is passing the baton of leadership to a new generation. Discipleship. Jesus has passed his authority, his discipleship, his knowledge, his way, if you please, to the 12 apostles, minus Judas. They have gathered more and more followers through these last 25 years of the history of the church. Paul, Peter and Paul, those two apostles being of primary importance according to the gospel record. And now Paul is preparing to pass the baton to a new generation 2 Timothy chapter 2, that we would teach people who would teach other people to teach a fourth generation also. So here's some final thoughts in application of the text. Several. One's character, consistency, faithfulness, and diligence give credibility to his ministry and witness. Your integrity and your personal reputation are the most valuable thing that you have other than eternal life and God's forgiveness. Your reputation. Your reputation gives your testimony credibility or incredibility. If you don't have a testimony, if you live a hypocritical Christian life, you, in essence, void your testimony for Christ. The Lord desires all Christians to be involved in ministry. Everybody is a minister. In our church, and it ought to be in yours and any church, every member a minister. Everybody should bring his or her gifts and talents to the table and be willing to go to work in the church somewhere, somehow. There's lots of different responsibilities in churches. There's only one guy <clears throat> that essentially stands behind the pulpit every Sunday morning and preaches the word of God. But there are scores of others who teach Sunday schools, who work in nurseries, who repair broken facilities, who clean, who disciple, who evangelize, 
who work in sports ministries, who in, are involved in Bible Institute and home life uh, Bible studies and big picture Bible studies and ladies Bible studies and go to the prisons and reach out to people who are uh, imprisoned or go to the hospitals and reach out to people in nursing homes who are infirmed, etc. A lot of people, a lot of jobs to do that need to be done by someone. Every member a minister. Christians waive their rights at conversion and become followers of Christ. For me to live as Christ. And there's two kinds of people in this world, the givers and the takers. Which of those two categories do you find yourself in? There is no place for power grabbers or personality worship, for accumulating stuff and living a life dedicated to self and self fulfillment in Christianity. The Christian life is a life of letting go. It's a life of simplicity. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Four years later, Paul wrote the epistle to Ephesians, and 37 years later, John the Apostle wrote the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter number 2. From the establishment of this church in chapters 18, 19, 20 of the book of Acts to the writing of Ephesians about four years after what we're reading now and to Revelation chapter number two, we can see how the church has changed or let me put it this way. What is important to the Holy Spirit of God bring to their attention? Probably many things have changed, many things have not. But things that have changed or are called into question, we read about in Revelation chapter 2. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, 37 years later after Paul, Address the elders. And thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. That's good. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. That's good. And hast found them liars. And hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. That is good. A good report so far on the report card. Nevertheless. Uh oh. Nevertheless. I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. What could that be? Could that statement go all the way back to Acts chapter 20 when Paul in verse 17, 18, 19, 20 through 24 when Paul said, you know my testimony. Number one, serving the Lord. Number two, teaching Christians the whole counsel of God. Number three, reaching the lost, Jews and Gentiles, repentance toward God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And my fourth and final and least priority was taking care of myself. I let God take care of me. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. We continue now. Next time we get together, we're going to look at chapter number 21, and the story moves quickly. This is history more and more history and narrative and we'll move even more quickly we'll probably do just about a chapter in each segment in 30 35 minutes we'll be uh, uh, knocking off a chapter just reading through the text and making some comments but again my con my uh, concern is we've given you a notebook i am not taking the time to say everything or comment on everything that's in the text or in the notebook but we've given you a notebook that can kind of fill in some of the details that we're not able to discuss 
in these sessions. So we want you to take a break now.